So welcome everyone to the second session of uh, the Medievalisms on the Screen conference. My name is Vania and I'm one of the co-organizers of this conference alongside Juan Manuel, Juan Bautista, Evren Carolina and Professor Burecci. I wish to thank them all alongside the Department of Medieval Studies to giving us this opportunity of organizing such a wonderful conference this year. So before I briefly uh, introduce the first panelist chair, let me give you a couple of technical details on the running of this conference. First, make sure that your Zoom name is the same that you put in the registration form so that we can make sure uh, of your identity because we have some bad experiences yesterday. Second, uh, your microphone should be turned off during the panel presentations and we will have uh, all the presentations in the panel one after the other. Uh, after all the panelists have given their papers, uh, we will open the floor for discussions and questions. So if you're a member of the audience, please uh, type your question in the chat box uh, only when the Q&A session starts. Otherwise, they are going to get lost in the chat box. Uh, and, uh, you know, if the question is not clear, we will we'll unmute you ourselves. Uh, uh, we will give you some time to do so. Uh, while the panelists and the chair are free to directly engage in questions and discussion by just turning the microphone on. Also, uh, be aware that this session is going to be recorded. Uh, so if you want to turn off your camera or you're not comfortable with that, uh, just make sure that you know this. So without further ado, uh, let's jump uh, right into the first panel for today, uh, which is titled Imagining Non-Western Medieval Worlds and brings together an amazing group of scholars uh, working on medievalisms in Japan with Claudia Bonillo, in Korea with Andre Marquantai, and India with Lubna Irfan. The panel will be chaired by Professor Daniel Seaman. Uh, Professor Daniel Seaman uh, has completed his PhD on the origins of Bulgaria, looking at Eastern and Western cultural influences involved in this phenomenon, has been lecturer at the University of Cologne before moving to the Department of Medieval Studies in 2009 as associate professor, where he continues to work on the history of early medieval Bulgaria as well as early medieval canon law. He has been involved in various research projects, including Metzerna, the Medieval Central Europe Research Network. So thank you very much for your patience in this introduction. I wish you enjoy the panel and I leave the floor to you, Daniel. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, Vanya. Um, does everybody hear me? Is the audio fine? Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you very much for this kind introduction. And um, uh, I would like to thank all the organizers for this fantastic conference. And I see that there's a great, great interest in these topics. And that's really uh, fantastic that uh, uh, they can all now convene and that we can have this conference here. So thanks once again for organizing it. And then now it's my, my pleasure to introduce the first speaker. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, Claudia Bonillo. Um, she's um, a, a doctoral student uh, at the University of uh, Zaragoza. Uh, and at the same time, um, um, also uh, at the Kyoto uh, University, thanks to a Japanese government uh, scholarship. Um, she graduated in computer engineering at the University of Zaragoza, but um, she has a passion for Japanese culture. And um, so she uh, studied also Japanese language and arts, and she completed um, with honors a postgraduate diploma in Japanese studies as well. Um, so um, she has also published on this topic already, which can all, uh, the, all these publications can um, be found on her academia page. So I will uh, not list them all, but um, um, I can uh, just name one. This is a legendary fi figures in a globalized world intercultural relations through drifters manga and um, she's now uh, working on her um, uh, phd um, this phd project uh, aims at analyzing the transmission of the sengoku period through japanese popular culture and the topic she will talk about today 
is at a gallop through the age of the warring states, the history of the Takeda clan according to Nomunaga's ambition sphere of influence. So, Claudia, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the kind presentation, Dr. Ziman. If you let me, I'm going to share my screen. Mm -hmm. um, is everything okay? You can see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Okay, then I will begin. Well, uh, hello everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for accepting my proposal. If anyone has any questions about my presentation or would like to contact me, please do not hesitate to use the email address on the screen. Without further ado, I am going to start my presentation. I will begin with a brief introduction to the video game under study, as well as a brief historical contextualization. I will then go on to break down the authenticity criticism of the historical events of the video game and end with uh, some brief conclusions. On the 12th of December 2013, the 13 installment of the Nobunaga no Yabo saga, subtitled Zozo, was released in Japan for PC and PlayStation 4 to critical and commercial acclaim. Two years later, it would be released with similar achievement in the rest of the world under the name Nobunaga's Ambition Sphere of Influence, the console version which we have used for this article. Koi's director, Sibusawa Ko, a central figure in the production of this game, has stated on several occasions that he is passionate about history, especially the Sengoku period in which many of his works are set. He has commented that the present saga can be a good starting point for young people to open their eyes to how interesting history is. Also, of course, entertainment is also very important. The importance of historical content in the video game is reflected in the short scenes that can be unlocked during the game known as historical events, of which there are 364, although there is no evidence that they have relied on the advice of experts to make them. The criticism of the authenticity of other elements of this video game, the representation of its protagonist, and the veracity of its setting have shown that Nobunaga's ambition, sphere of influence, is a video game to be taken into account when studying the diffusion of Japanese medieval history. All this has led to delve into the representation of one of the key clans of the Sengoku period, the Takeda clan, through a selection of the most important events in which they are protagonists. This video game is set in the Sengoku period, also known as the Era of the Warring States, which is considered to encompass part of the Muromachi and Azuchimo Moyama periods, beginning with the Onin War, a major civil war that marked the end of the authority exerted by the military-style central government, and ended with the rise to power of General Tokugawa Ieyasu in 1603, shortly after his victory at the Battle of Sekigahara for the unification of the nation in 1600. The Sengoku period is characterized by an almost total absence of central asset power during which the emperor, based in the capital of Kyoto, had no executive power, compounded by the removal of the Sikaga Shogunate by General Oda Nobunaga in 1573. Power was thus left in the hands of the feudal lords of Daimyo, leaders of microstates called Kuni, each with different objectives, but the concern of protecting and expanding their own territory and ultimately unifying the country. The story of the Takeda clan begins in the 64th heaven during the time of Takeda Nobutora, the 18th leader of the Takeda clan of the K domain, present day prefecture of Yamanasi, who, despite inheriting the clan's command at the age of only 14, was responsible for, was responsible for unifying the clan with a combination of military power and diplomacy. The game mentions how, despite his achievements, the clan situation was in danger due to the many enemies they had made, especially with the Hojo clan in Sagami and their relatives, the Imagawa to the west. Starting with the Imagawa, after provoking the surrender of Oi Nobusato, a part of the Imagawa clan, it was agreed that his daughter would marry Nobutora to establish an alliance, which did not prevent them from continuing to fight constantly. Nobutora also fell out with the Uitsuna of the Hoyo clan during his attempted conquest of the Kanto region in 1524. 
Even 65 begins by mentioning that Nobutora has been alternating battles with peace treaties with the Magawa clan for years, and now they had succession disputes. Between Yoshimoto and Yoshisane, the two candidates to succeed the Magawa leadership, Nobutora decides to support the rightful heir, Yoshimoto. This succession dispute is known as Hanakura no Ran, or the Hanakura Revolt, a name spelled with the kanji for flower, which is referenced in the name of this event. The trigger was the sudden death of the clan leader, Imagawa Ujiteru, shortly after returning from a meeting with Hoyu Jitsune in Odawara in 1536. The following day, his younger brother died, throwing the clan into chaos. Sengaku Yoho, later known as Yoshimoto, then 18, was the most promising candidate. The first to oppose his inheritance of the clans was his older half-brother, Genko Etan, also known as Yoshisane, whom Yoshimoto managed to defeat in battle with the support of the Hoyo clan. After his defeat, what was left of the Fukushima clan fled to Kei's territory, and although there was a faction of the Takeda clan who was in favor of supporting him, Nobutora refused to give them shelter, thus demonstrating his loyalty to Yoshimoto. The theme of is further elaborated in the next event, which begins by mentioning the name of the Hanakura revolt and features a conversation between Taigen Sesai, a vassal monk of the Magawa clan, and Yoshimoto, who is grateful for the support of Takeda Nobutora, whose daughter Yokeini he has taken as his wife. Indeed, once Yoshimoto took over, over at the new leader of the clan, in 1537, Nobutora sent his daughter to become his lawful wife, establishing an alliance with the Magawa clan that would remain quite stable for the rest of his rule. This event also sees the first appearance of Harunobu, later known as Takeda Shingen, who is not in favor of his father's policies and believes that his constant disagreements will cause him to set the clan to his brother Nobusige. Nobutora's preferential treatment of his second son, Nobusige, is something that is mentioned in the Gunki, Koyo Gunkan, but for which there is not conclu conclusive evidence. Even 68 discusses Nene's marriage to Yorisige as part of Nobutora's strategy to take over Suwa, adding that the Suwa shrine was dedicated to a god called Suwa Myojin, worshipped as the god of war by the warriors of Sinano, with whom Nobutora hoped to curry favor. The shrine referred to is the Suwa Taisa in prefecture of Nagano, a shrine complex already mentioned in the Koji Ki and the Nihon Soki, and indeed highly valued by the warriors of the area. The next event is set after the successful siege of Toishi Castle, when the Uno clan is driven out of Sinano and has to give the castle to the Murakami clan. Nobutora heads to Suruga to celebrate his victory and visit his daughter. Meanwhile, he leaves his castle to Harunobu. Nobutora's de after Nobutora's departure, Harunobu reinforced his Kai's defenses, and he was in cahoots with the Magawa Yoshimoto to have his father removed from Kai. This event introduces the Takeda clan succession conflict, hereby, uh, um, uh, uh, whereby Harunobu, better known as Singen, would take over from his father Nobutora as head of the clan. On June 14, 1541, after completing the invasion of the Chisagata district in the Sinano domain and on his way to Kai, Nobutora decided to detour to the Suga domain to pay a courtesy visit to his daughter and her husband, Yoshimoto, and to strengthen his ties with the Magawa clan. Knowing of his father's visit, Singen dispatched soldiers to Kawauchi and closed the borders of Kai, thus exiling his father to Suga. There are several theories as to why Singen exiled his father. The Koyo Gunkan speaks of the despotic nature of Nobutora, who punished his vassals without cause, although it is generally considered that, since Singen was over the years glorified as a hero, it was necessary to turn his father into a villain in order to justify his, uh, his rebellion. Another theory, also supported by the Koyo Gunkan, tells of how Singen resented his father for prioritizing his younger brother Nobusige. So, before he publicly ceded the position to him, he decided to stage a coup d'etat. The seventh event, as the name suggests, is already set with Harunobu at the head of the Takeda clan, and narrates his meeting with Yamamoto Kansuke and the recommendation of Itagaki Nobukata. Kansuke talks about how he has traveled through different territories studying their geography and customs. He also studies military strategy and specializes in cheese. Nobukata had, as, had asked for a hundred can as a stipend for him, a very high figure that horrifies the other vassal, Amari Torayasu. Harunobu, however, opts to give him 200 can. 
His real name is believed to be Yamamoto Haruyuki, a samurai who traveled through Japan until he was 26 years old, learning various skills, including military tactics, spear wielding and castle building, and entering single service when he was 44 years old. The detail of the estipends is taken from the Koyogunkan. In Ukiyo-e, Kansuke is depicted as crippled and one-eyed, which eye is not specified, a design that is respected in the video game. Event 71 introduces us to another of the Takeda clan's vassals, Kudo Genzaemon, who had been unjustly exiled from Kai by Nobutora. Under Singe's leadership, however, he welcomes him back into the clan, giving him the, main, the name Masatoyo and the clan surname Naito. Not much is known about Naito Surinosuke Masatoyo, nicknamed Gonzaemon. He was part of the Kudosi family, chief vassal for a generation of Takeda clan, and he won various medics under Shingen and died during the clan's last great battle at Nagasino. The 72nd event set in the 11th year of the Tensho era at the Tutsuji Asaki Palace in Kai. Shingen plans to attack the Suwakan in Shinano, with whom he had maintained a peaceful relationship, because they had formed an alliance with the Yamanouchi Uesugi clan without consulting him. This event is framed by the contest by the conquest of Sinano, which took place from June 1542 and was Singen's first move after officially taking command of the Takeda clan. It began with the invasion of the Suwa district, which is the focus of this event, and pitted him against Suwa Yorisige, a former ally and husband of his younger sister Nene, who had just given him an heir. The cause of the conflict, which is summarized in the video game, was that while the Takeda clan was in the midst of a succession conflicts during Nobutora's exile, Uesugi Norimasa took the opportunity to invade the Saku and, Chis and Chisagata districts, causing Yorisige to establish an alliance and even divide the territories, without consulting either the Takedas or the Murakamis, who were still his allies at the time. The 74th event is set after the successful conquest of Uehara Castle and the subsequent surrender of the Suwa clan. The video game tells us how Yorisige was temporarily taken to Kai, although they later decide to execute him. In fact, Singen took Yorisige and his brother Yoritaka to Kai, forcing them shortly thereafter to commit seppuku at the Tokoji in the city of Kofu. However, Singen had made a deal with the Suwa family that, in exchange for saving the life of Yorisige and Nene's son Toraomaru, he would take as a concubine the daughter Yorisige had had with a woman of the Omishi clan, Suwa Goryoni, called Suwahime in the video game, who would later give birth to Singen's heir, Katsuyori. The 75th event continues to deepen Sinano's invasion by following the conquest of Takato Castle, which, also not mentioned in the video game, happened, uh, happened between 1544 and 1545, along with the conquest of Fukuyo Castle, and would allow him to take control of the Kamina district in Nagano. The second part of the event introduces uh, Sanada Yukitaka, also called Yukitsuna, who fled to end after the destruction of the House of Uno. Also not mentioned, the video game is referring to the Battle of Unno Taira, in which the Takeda, Suwa, and Murakami clans jointly attacked. And although Yukitaka was indeed from the Uno family, he became a vassal of Shingen around 1544. He would also take part in the conquest of Shioda Castle, Wedahara Castle, and Toisi Castle, which is the focus of the next event. In fact, Singen had already attempted to conquer this castle in 1550, becoming non, uh, known as Toizi Kusure and considered the greatest defeat of Singen's career in Texas at the Kohakusaiki. He lost over a thousand men, as recorded in the Katsuyama Ki. He would try again in 1551, this time placing Yukitaka in command, who managed to conquer the castle by infiltrating his men, allowing the castle to be opened from the inside. The 77th event is set after the conquest of Toisi and tells how Murakami Yoshikiyo is the only obstacle standing in the way of Singen conquest of Shinano. In the second part of the event, Singen and Kansuke recite a sentence from Sun Tzu that is seen on the screen. This sentence is taken in particular from chapter 7 of The Art of War, a popular reading among Sengoku period generals, and a shortened version in kanji pronouncing Furin Kazan is the one for which the event is named and which was written on one of the Takeda clan's flag types who is which are conserved in the Takeda Jinja, the Sonsi no Hata or Sonsi Shiyo no Hata. Event 81 describes the formation of the Triple Alliance, in which Yoshinobu marries the daughter of Imagawa Yoshimoto, and his daughter Oba-in marries the son of Hoyo Uyasu. 
It was established in 1554, and it is known as the Koso Sun Sengoku Domain, or Alliance of the Three Dominions of Kai, Sagami, and Suruga, the territories controlled by the Takeda, Hoyo, and Imagawa clans, respectively. It was one of the most significant events of the first half of the Sengoku period, as it brought together the three most powerful clans of the time, and also during their parents' generation, the three clans had been at odds, this relationship gradually began to change once their respective sons took over. Um, Event 83 introduces what is, is to be the focus of the following events, and in general of Takeda Singen's character in popular culture, his relationship with Nagao Kagetora, better known as Wesui Kenshin, praised at the reincarnation of Bisamonten, the god of war. This event also features Ko Sakamasanobu, better known as Kasuga Toratsuna, with whom Singen shared a series of documents on education and philosophy that are believed to be the basis for writing the Koyo Gunkan. The next three events, starting with the 84th, tell of what is known as the Battle of Kawanakajima, which lasted from 1553 to 1564 and was fought over five battles, the bloodiest being the four in 1561, during which Takeda Nobusige, Singa's younger brother, and the strategist Yamamoto Kansuke were killed, on which the next three events focus. During the event, Kansuke explains the title strategy, the Woodpecker tactic, Kitsutsuki Senpo, according to which Nobuharu and Masano will attack Kagetora from behind when he appears on Sayo Sun Mountain in front of Kaisu Castle. When they flee, Singen and his soldiers will attack them. Also, this is indeed the strategy believed to have been followed in this battle. Its name is taken from the Koetsu in Senroku, an eight volume chronicle by an un unknown author written in the later half of the Edo period, specifically from 1810 onwards. On the screen, we can see the part where it is mentioned, translated into modern Japanese by Professor Okazawa Yoshiyuki. Even 85 very briefly introduces the beginning of the tactic in which Kansuke, Masanobu, and Nobuharu are on the mountain of Sayo san, while Even 86 into the mist introduces Masanobu and Nobuharu who are awaiting the arrival of Kenshin's army, although they soon realize that they have been uncovered and Kenshin is making his way down the mountain to Hachimambara, where the bulk of this fourth fight, is, uh, which is also as Hachimambara no Tatakai, took place. In Event 87, Kansuke wants to go into exile for being the mastermind of the failed woodpecker tactic. Kansuke leaves the main force of the Takeda clan and is intercepted by troops with the B of Bisa Mountain in their banners. In fact, the Wesui Hakubutsukan Museum in the city of Yonezawa holds one that belonged to the clan. He comes face to face with Kagetora, challenges him and asks how he guessed his plan. As Kansuke dies at Kagetora's hands, he understands at that moment that it is the smoke from the campfires that gave them away. The general narrative of the event matches the one shared by Professor Okazawa, and this last detail about how it was the smoke from the food being prepared by that, uh, the Takeda clan that alerted Kenshin to their intentions, which is further developed in the events of the video game related to the Uesugi clan, it is described in the Hokuet Sogundan, a 51 volume chronicle that tells the story of the Wesui clan from the establishment of the Nagaoshi family to the death of Kenshin. Finally, the ATF event talks about how the fourth battle of Kawanakajima was the most violent, in which the legend of Kenshin attacking Singen base camp by himself was forged. This refers to an anecdote told in the third chapter of the eighth volume of the aforementioned Koetsu in Senroku Chronicle, which can be seen in the screen, in which Kenshin is said to have stormed the Takeda camp on horseback and attacked Singen with a Mitachi, a blow that Singen intercepted with his gunpai. The analysis of the main historical events featuring the Takeda clan, we have seen how the game presents an accurate, albeit simplified, view of the most important events involving Takeda Singen and, to a lesser extent, his father Nobutora. Its main sources are the Gunki, or chronicles written during the Edo period that narrate the lives of the most famous generals of the preceding eras, which rely on a mixture of historical documents and hearsay, and whose vision is perpetuated today through the new media of popular culture. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you very much um, for this fascinating lecture. Um, Mrs. Borido was very interesting. As you know, the discussion will take place um, just at mm -hmm. the very end. So now we will uh, now turn to the next speaker. And mm -hmm. it's a great pleasure uh, to have Andre Mak Pantai from the University of the Philippines 
here as our next speaker. Um, he is an interdisciplinary scholar of the arts and humanities. He's currently pursuing art studies at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, with a focus on new media and East Asian studies. His current research focuses on Korea and the Hallyu Korean wave as a rising cultural power of the 21st century. And the topic of his talk will be medieval representation in Korean dramas of the Silla, Goryeo, and Johnson periods. So, Mr. Mark Pantai, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let me just share my screen. All right. Uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you for that uh, to our organizers, co-panelists, and participants. Uh, this paper is the medieval representation in Korean dramas of the Sila, Koryo, and Joseon period. And in Korean, uh, to everyone. And uh, for this one, I prepared a very, very visual and audiovisual heavy presentation as we believe in art studies that as we immerse in actual art, we get to understand, especially explore uh, how medieval is represented in these dramas. So first, just a background. Uh, this Korean dramas, or Korean historical dramas, as they, uh, they call it in Korea, sagoks, have continuously influenced the conception of medievalism in Asia. And the international success of the Korean wave, uh, a lot of people have heard about K-pop, K-dramas in parts of the world, especially in Southeast Asia. And I contextualized it in Southeast Asia, especially in the Philippines, that these dramas have offered as an alternative on Western notions of medievalism. And just a background about sakoks, these are your Korean historical dramas. They are usually characterized by their derivative representation of the Middle Ages in Korea, and meticulously produced props, costumes, and plots, as you can see in the production sets, and uh, featuring historical landmarks and remnants of this civilization's um, use of computer-generated imagery to recreate, and um, fantasy elements that are added. And of course, Korean dramas are known to add Sorry, to add love story as its plot. Um, the conception of this and the perception of people in Sagok is very critical, especially in Korea. Recently, uh, the one you see on your left is uh, Just an Exorcist has been cancelled after just two episodes of airing due to so-called historical inconsistencies. So it gives us an idea on how um, critical are the uh, consumption of people or the people are of these dramas. And the other one received also a backlash called um, Mr. Queen, which opens up more dialogues on um, maybe gender studies and more. So the objective of the paper, I just to guide us, I have set four. First is to just maybe explore the rhetoric of medievalism in the aspects of one, social political condition of the period, and two is the state of the arts and the culture. And we also, uh, would historicize it and try to at least test its accuracy and determine uh, its limitation based on text history. Um, also, we contextualize it on its influence on the perception of people using different theories and popular culture. And we also, also examine the dichotomy offered as an alternative to Western dominant notions of medievalism. So some just uh, framework of Sago usually formed by history, the fiction and the added aesthetics. And in when we say, Sagok as a form of art is an interaction between the artist, the director, the actors themselves, what they create, the audience perception, of course, the reality of the world. And I use some ideas and frameworks in art history, say the sensitivity to causal history, but we won't go to those uh, complicated um, theories for now. So I have chosen three. Uh, let's go to the first one. This is Warang, the poet, warrior youth. Uh, this is set in the historical context of Sheila, which is the Korean kingdom uh, during that three kingdom period of Korea, three kingdoms. And the warangs of Sheila, they revolve around this, they so-called beautifully dressed men warriors, the flower warriors. And as it, they struggle with the political challenges brought upon by the bone rank system. 
And the main prompt of the film was uh, uh, the relationship between uh, the, the, so the warangs and uh, their interaction with the current systems. Uh, this is a, a depiction of warang in the film on your right in the series and a painting of warang in Korea. And as you can see here, this is a picture of recreation of a modern warang versus the, the one they depicted in the series. And uh, what is interesting about this is that we actually see how is uh, Chila at that period in time. And what is dominant is what the so-called bone ranking system. The bone ranking system is very unique in Chile because, as you know, in a lot of um, other civilizations, it's all about the blood. But in Chile, it's about the bone. And the sacred bones are usually the members of the royal family who have a divine right to rule, while the true bones are the ones who are the members of nobility. And as you can see here, there's um, a sculptural or architectural representation of the bones and uh, uh, their attires, okay? And one character, which was uh, called Dogbird, and who was based on the, uh, on the general Kim Isabu in Korea, was actually, has actually gone through these different um, sages. First, he was um, from an exile part, as you can see in the very first picture, and then he became a warang, uh, that's in a sense true bone, uh, due to certain um, plot elements, but at the end of the day, he, uh, he was revealed to be a, a, a sacred bone. As you can see, he was wearing it. And one thing I want to point out is um, the representations based on their costumes and dresses. Uh, as you can see here, he was um, shown to be wearing red, uh, something, a color associated for the royalty. And the series actually showed a lot of arts and culture, especially the warang. The warangs are taught in not just the art of war, swordsmanship, and archery, but also in the different arts, such as um, dances, music, literature. So th these are an army which is uh, very different from others. They are they are trained in various um, arts. As you can see here, uh, just for uh, architecture of the period. So they are training, and this is a sword demonstration that I will. Play. then a dance from the period and music. period we get to see two historical figures that ruled the Shila kingdom. Uh, for once there's King, uh, the queen, Queen Jiso, who became regent as um, there are stories that uh, she sent his son or the, the crown prince to be because of assassination attempts leading to the formation of the warang. And for us, we give a particular uh, interest in their attires and their symbolism, as you can see. The, the symbolism of red in this uh, particular period. Uh, the queen usually represented by the phoenix and the throne of the king or the attires of the king usually represented by a dragon and also the importance of white and gold during the period. And so another interesting um, topic in this uh, series is the existence of the wonwas. The wonwas are the, the precursors to the warangs and they are female warriors. And what's interesting about the one was is that they were said to have um, fought each other and killed each other due to jealousy, which opens up more dialogues on the role of women during this period. As you can see, at one point, we have a queen who became a regent 
and on another there is this um quite vilified image of the one was in the series and lastly of course these also portrayed war with other kingdoms like Bekje, and they are actually taught in the art of war and we would see just a snippet of it <laughs> Just very short. But now we would proceed to the next um, series. This one, uh, this one is uh, Scarlet Heart Trio, which is a uh, much more fantastic or fantasy than the other. It's set in Goryeo. So after the Three Kingdom periods, you have now the unification of the Korean Peninsula, and they say it's a true national unification. And this um, series, on the other hand, tackles the po po politics between the royal princes. Uh, certain princes, if I believe, various ranking princes as they fight for the throne. And this is under the rule of King Tejo of Koryo, and he was the one who achieved the unification of the later three kingdoms. And just um, three few characters, we have Wang Mu, uh, the crown prince, uh, who also became a king of Koryo. Wang Yu is a third prince, and but we would um, not further dwell on it. Wang Su is the fourth prince, um, fourth king of Koryo, and these are just some um, um, how they are portrayed in some images and paintings that they are portrayed in real life. And what is interesting is that this series revolve around rivalry, not just by the princes, but their um, mothers, or they are royal consorts. And there is a political rivalry between two queens um, shown in here, but historical uh, analysis doesn't really uh, give us a, a strong foundation on, on these kinds of uh, rivalries. Uh, but exploring the art and sculpture, the most, uh, I think, interesting about the series, it's its recreation of the um, the background of the Goryeo period in terms of art and culture. For example, the throne rooms, as you can see here, their costumes, the court, the royal court, uh, particular interest on their headpieces, their uh, attires, the throne, as they, are, they have created it, the details and the patterns, the usual um, dining or even the, um, the table wares. And also this is a recreation of a bathhouse at that point of time that they have created. Um, the litter, the litter that carries the royal and the ceremonies that they, uh, they parade uh, amongst the people. And also it's depicted um, a marriage, a traditional a marriage, not just any marriage, but a royal marriage. Um, so you can see the headwear of the uh, royal lady in here and the armies, the, their armors and how they're created, which is actually very different with the previous ones that we see in the Shilya period and the court ladies and their roles in the, in the, in the royal household as they were immersed in not just um, uh, service, but rather also in how they study the literatures and uh, also portrayal of, of punishments such as um, executions and some uh, presentation of actual architecture, surviving architectures from that period, palaces. So we won't go further, but we would go to Chosun period, which I think would be much more interesting for a lot of us. Chosun uh, was a Korean dynasty that lasted for approximately five centuries and it was the last um, dynasty of Korea and the longest ruling Confucian dynasty. Um, okay. And Love in the Moonlight tells the love story between Lee Yong, which is the crown prince of Chosun, and the woman who pretended to be a eunuch. It's actually a very comedic um, series. And, but uh, alongside it, it portrays a crown, crown prince struggle with an impending ulcer plot and a very historical revolt. 
uh, the chosen site in politics is much more complicated. As we can see in the Shila, we have the system and the bone ranking. And then in Koryo, we have the various political ranking princesses, a uh, princess, I'm sorry. And in Joseon, we have the eunuch system. We have the yed head eunuch, the royal palace. And one thing is interesting is that you could immediately recognize someone's position in society based on their attire, not just by their attire, but their headpiece. I wanted to give particular um, attention to their headpieces. So for example, the first one would be our royal uh, a nobility. The, in the middle, we have our uh, crown prince, and the third one is a member of the royal guard. So two historical big figures is Prince Lee Yong, who was, I think, posthumously named king. But his, here he was just a prince, a crown prince, and his representation. Uh, we have a burnt painting in here, half burnt painting, and a recreation of who King Lee Yong is. And he was known to be a, 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 a prince who patronized the arts. Not just the arts, music, dance, and said to have choreographed dances, which we might see uh, a few uh, later. And he was the main character in the film and portrayed to be uh, as it, he is historically. Um, but this is under the rule of King Sunjo, his father. And basically, um, another interesting fact is we get to see a prime minister in Korea at this point in time called Premier, Premier Kim. And in this series, he was given a, a role as a villain uh, with a plot of an ass assassination at, against the uh, crown prince. But historically, of course, this really is not back as um, it wasn't really, it, there's no text proving this kind of plot. So we could see how writers actually make uh, this plot's a portrayal. Another one is Hong Gyeong Ne. As I have said, there is a historical rebellion. As you can see here, this is um, this is him portrayed though with a, a peasant hat, a headpiece. And Hong Gyeong Ne's rebellion was due to tax policies during the period. And um, his daughter, who was the one who had a, re a romantic relationship with the crown prince, was the one uh, was uh, the main plot of the series, but this one is, of course, a work of fiction compared to the historical basis, which is Hong Kyung Nae's rebellion. And he's from the present North Korea, Pyongyang. Um, Chosen art and culture. Uh, the Crown Prince is a very, uh, it's a supporter of the arts and culture. And as you can see, we could uh, determine uh, various rankings based on their headpieces not just the royals, but even nobility in here, and uh, the ones who are uh, usually at the bottom of the social hierarchy. And the eunuch system and how to be a eunuch is portrayed. There will be physical examinations, uh, written examinations on how to be a eunuch and palace um, members of the royal court. And the architectural uh, architecture, as they represent uh, things that have survived from the period, palaces, throne rooms, also as we could see the difference in details, which is very minute if we can compare it with the others. And some festivals like the Lantern Festival was depicted. As I have mentioned earlier, one of um, Prince Lee Young's uh, contribution to uh, this period was in terms of dance and um, music. And there are um, some texts that says that he might have choreographed. And here's one dance portrayed in the film that is said to be inspired by his mother.
there. It's very interesting because it's um, something that might have been based on um, what he might have actually created. Now we would go to, that's a very, very brief um, exploring these things that we could act, that would actually fit um, um, just this presentation, but just examining some of uh, how it works, I think, is that first we see history versus what is fiction. You can see historical figures are, are real, real as is. 12, the 13 princes are based on real characters Art and culture is heavily based on text and on what is surviving and their ideas of the certain period. The societal and political structure as the same thing with historical developments as the rebellion. But there are also fictional elements that they employ, such as fictional characters, fantasy elements, and plot devices, such as in the um, case of Scarlet Heart Rio, which is, uh, I forgot to mention, it was actually a woman from the current period, the current times, modern period, who went back to Corio after an eclipse. And then there is, what's interesting is the interaction. The interaction, if you would actually remember, I said that people are very critical of this, especially in, to, in, to, uh, in topics of historical revisionism. But the fantasy and history usually intersect a lot, especially with regards to character story, character relationship and events. For example, the prime minister was given a role as a villain who had a plot against the crown prince or the queens having political rivalries and doing each other just for their son to be the one on the throne. And character relationships such as uh, the woman being daughter of the, re the rebellion leader and having a romantic relationship with Grand Prince Leong. And also some events that were created, for example, in the Bekje and Sila war, uh, they are indeed in war and there are certain uh, war, a uh, small war that happened, but of course the series would put much more explanation related to the characters. And so these are their interactions of history and fantasy, which we have uh, based on examining history and testing its limitation accuracies. And the popular influence and perception, I think is the most important uh, in this analysis as I have added this when I saw the, the actual topic of this panel is that it enriched discourse and development and change as this is in the context of the Philippines, change in the sense of uh, history, historical change, at least for popular consumers. And it also it interrogates Western legacies in development thinking in the Philippines entrenched by US education and pop culture. Uh, this is uh, uh, largely based on a study by Clemente in 2020. And also it contextualizes Korean drama as a representation of counter dominant cultural flows within cultural flows in Asia. So for someone who doesn't have an idea of medievalism or, or my idea of medievalism back then was very Western centric. But this one, seeing this in televisions, which are uh, in being offered, you would get a sort of an idea that medievalism exists in Asia and what it, it looks like. Um, also, according to Clemente, the conclusion is un it unpacks the complex content in Korean historical drama through intertextual analysis and provokes a critical elucidation of the notions of development and change and undertones, which is uh, important in the development discourse in the Philippines. As I have mentioned, it has been a great basis of medievalism uh, and popular culture and, of course, non-Western medievalism in the Philippines. So some, just some concluding thoughts. We see that there are differences and changes, some differences and changes on social political structure in various points of history, because these are actual three different periods in Korea, cultural developments and differences in art and aesthetics. And so derivation from historical texts, there, needs, there, there, was, there is always a historical text or historical basis of the sagups before it is adopt, uh, adopted and they also adopt historical figures. And uh, they recreate arts and culture of for a specific period um, and represent it in the screen. And, but there is a very limited representation of historical events and creation of fictional elements as at the end of the day, these are idealized as not really a historical um, documentary, but rather still based on the plot that the writers want to give their 
uh, audiences. They would still want to center the story on the love story of the characters compared to actually representing actual history. And one of the most important conclusion is the interrogation of Western legacies and offering an alternative to Western dominated notion of medievalism to the general public. And I think that's it. I hope you have had an idea of how uh, how briefly we have explored and traveled to medieval Korea in this presentation. Thank you very much. And Korea comes Hamida. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, journey to, to Korea and uh, the perceptions of uh, medieval Korean, Korean culture. And now um, our next speaker will be Lubna Irfan from the Aligarh Muslim University. Aligarh, it's, it's about 130 kilometers southeast from Delhi. So for those who are not so familiar with um, the uh, geography of India, um, she is an assistant professor of history at uh, Women's College um, there at Aligarh Muslim University. She has recently submitted her thesis on the topic secular public utility buildings in North India, 1200 to 1750 um, AD. Um, her areas of interest are popular history social cultural history, history of art and architecture and gender history. She has participated in a number of national and international conferences and uh, has also published a lot of uh, articles and um, certainly her uh, PhD will also be published as a book, I uh, guess. So um, I, just to, to give you an impression, uh, um, she has uh, all her publications listed uh, in the uh, CV on her web page. Um, so there's, for example, water architecture in medieval North uh, India, reflections on the life it sustained or marketplaces in medieval India. She has also a lot of online publications. So publications on online websites, online journals and so on. And she is also the founder of, an, of a, a web page, a website, uh, Itihas Ke Karigar, the sneak peek into history, uh, which tries somehow uh, to popularize history. And it's also a very interesting app website. So uh, please have a look at it. Uh, then you get, a, I think, a very interesting impression also of architecture, culture, everyday life, whatever. Um, so the topic she will uh, talk uh, about today is rereading. Um, the Yodha Akbar in the times of Latif Jihad in India. So, Ms. Irfan, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for that detailed introduction, Dr. Zaman. Uh, I'd, start, I'd like to start sharing my screen. Um, I hope the audience would be able to see it. I hope my screen is visible to all of you right now. Great. Right. So uh, in context of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, it's related to how history is created uh, or recreated in that sense in present times. Uh, when we talk about India, Indian history throughout uh, from earlier uh, earliest times, ancient period to the medieval uh, period to modern period to say post-modern period uh, has been uh, recreated in modern times. And uh, the time that we are living in today uh, has uh, somehow uh, developed an impression of a medieval India, which might or might not be true, but it has served uh, a purpose in present times. So uh, in Indian context, the partition that happened in 1947 after the uh, ending of colonial rule, Indian subcontinent, uh, just a brief background. So Indian subcontinent was divided into two uh, separate nations, uh, and that division was based on religion. Uh, there were two major communities, Hindus and Muslims. Uh, Muslims demanded a different country, and uh, Pakistan was created. Right? Some of India was not a Hindu country. India remained a secular country, which uh, gave space gave space to Hindus and Muslims. Muslims who were left behind in India uh, somehow uh, eventually had to suffer the wrath of whatever happened in 
1947 partition. And the medieval Indian period, which is quote unquote Muslim uh, period of Indian history in which the rulers uh, and the people who were in political authority were uh, Islamic or Muslim by identity. So that medieval Indian period then became a playground for modern historians or modern cultural writers to recreate historical figures, to recreate historical narratives, to recreate historical uh, uh, assumptions in a way or myths you can say, to serve their own ends. And in that, uh, you know, narrative or recreation of medieval Indian past, they took certain characters, they took certain incidents, and they weaved an entire story around it. Uh, they might, the story might be true, the story might not be true, but the way in which it is presented is somehow problematic. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you an uh, overview of how Muslims are represented in modern cinema, in modern Hindi cinema. And uh, uh, I'm going to give uh, you this overview in context of a, a recently developed idea of love jihad. Uh, I come uh, to the details uh, in due time, uh, but before going into uh, those details, I'd just like to, uh, you know, uh, go over it again that how uh, medieval Indian uh, Muslim rule was used uh, as a narrative by the modern Indian, uh, say, majority communalists, uh, majoritarian communalists to justify the oppression of Muslims in present times. And there have been various incidents of uh, violence against Indian Muslims, which is a minority community in India. And uh, the narrative of medieval Indian Muslim oppression, how the Muslim invaders, how the Muslim rulers of medieval India oppressed the Hindu majority or Hindu indigenous population has been used time and again to justify uh, the oppression that is being uh, levied or, or that has been uh, you know, uh, put on uh, modern day Indian Muslims. And popular cinema, popular media plays an important role in, you know, propagation and perpetuation of that idea of invading, uh, hating uh, all powerful Muslim men. So uh, I'm just going to give you a brief, uh, you know, this idea of uh, a Muslim men who terrorize these Indian indigenous population. There, there have been visual depictions of these uh, Muslim men in most, uh, you know, most of the popular movies which talk about historical, uh, the, say a certain historical event or say a certain historical figure. So I'll just give a few examples here. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, if you people are familiar with uh, Indian cinema, uh, Padmavat was a movie that came out in 2018. Uh, it's a, it was a very popular movie. And uh, the representation of a medieval Indian ruler, Alauddin Khilji, in that movie has been questioned and has been, you know, uh, 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 has been a matter of discussion and debate amongst a lot of people, among a lot of scholars, and how he was represented. And he was represented in a barbaric, as a barbaric person, as a barbaric man who is, you know, devoid of emotions, devoid of any, uh, say, idea of uh, right or wrong, and just motivated by his own desires, motivated by his own will of capturing uh, a woman, capturing a queen whom he wants to make his. So that is one kind of representation, and that uh, representation of Muslims as barbaric, as uh, heinous, as, you know, uh, and uh, in these movies, the term monster uh, also, you know, has been, is used very easily for these uh, Muslim men or uh, so-called Muslim historical figures. So this is one example. And then we had a movie, uh, Panipat, in 2019, which uh, represents Alauddin Khilji. And interestingly, the eating habits, the way in which uh, they uh, eat food, it's very barbaric, it's uh, very uh, animal-like. So all those things, all those tropes are played out in this fashion in order to uh, demonize uh, Muslims and, you know, to use that demonization, to inculcate that in the minds of, you know, the popular audience, the audience who, who is watching this movie in present in present Indian context. And uh, interestingly, uh, there's another movie, Tanhachi, which presents a Mughal general uh, who is, again, uh, very barbaric, who is uh, aggressive, irrational, self-serving, etc., etc. So all these are the uh, popular narratives that are there or popular uh, movies uh, that are there of Hindi cinema. And these popular movies use this trope against uh, so-called Muslim men. Now, what is the narrative of love jihad? Now, love jihad is something uh, that is, uh, it was a sort of a notion that was in which it was uh, suggested <coughs> 
that Muslim men uh, somehow fool Hindu and Christian women into turning to Islamic faith. And they use uh, the method of, you know, falsely expressing love to the Hindu women and thus, uh, you know, manipulating them and, uh, you know, uh, converting and then eventually converting them to Islam. And this was a way of furthering their faith, uh, furthering Islam. And that is why it's called love jihad or Roma jihad. And uh, this uh, you know, became popular in 2019 when in Kerala, uh, uh, it was claimed that number of girls were uh, converted by uh, Muslims to Islamic faith uh, and they were fooled into this uh, uh, by uh, you know Muslim men. And Muslim men use money from various sources. They, they are being funded by uh, certain organizations in um, UAE or in the Middle East. And they are using that money to bring Hindu women to the Islamic you know, domain and to the Islamic uh, uh, religion as such and uh, there was a, a whole narrative that was there and uh, it started in 2009, 2009 and eventually it uh, somehow fade, uh, faded over a period of time and it resurfaced in 2020 when uh, obviously it was there when uh, 2000, in 2018 Padmavat was made and um, it has been you know coming up in various discussions, various debates, majoritarian communalists use this scope in order to justify um, you know not allowing uh, inter-religious marriages, not allowing interfaith uh, you know, coupling, not allowing Muslim men to uh, have a, a right over their own personal lives, and not just Muslim men, because in this narrative, uh, it's also uh, this is also very, uh, uh, in a way, uh, derogatory to the Hindu women as well, because they are uh, denied the right to towards their own bodies, towards their own emotions, towards their own minds, because uh, in this narrative there is no scope for genuine emotions. There is no scope for Hindu women or any women uh, as a, per se genuinely falling in love for somebody because uh, that is only manipulation and Muslim and Hindu marriages can only be out of manipulation, only be out of you know uh, one fooling the other, especially Muslim fooling the Hindu. So this is the narrative that was there and in 2020 there was an ad that was uh, advertisement that was uh, uh, put up by a jewelry brand Tanish and in that advertisement it was a very nice uh, sweet advertisement which showed a Hindu uh, daughter-in-law in a Muslim household and how uh, the Muslim household uh, which has Hindu daughter-in-law has accepted a certain Hindu uh, cultural uh, festivities and cultural events in order to make the daughter-in-law happy. So it was a very sweet, uh, very, uh, you know, upholding of the uh, cultural, uh, you know, Hindu Muslim unity cultural values that are there. And this was something that was uh, seen as a very problematic uh, uh, advertisement and eventually Tanish had to bring down uh, that uh, advertisement uh, you know, because uh, of the agitation that was made against uh, this particular advertisement and there was a whole uh, social media campaign uh, you know, uh, asking for boycotting of uh, this particular brand. So this is happening in uh, 2020 and uh, around the same time we also have that movie Tanhaji uh, from which I had so shown you uh, the clip of uh, the Mughal general who was Mughal army officer and uh, interestingly this is also a scene from uh, that movie there is a subplot in the movie which talks about um, the abduction of uh, a Hindu Rajput princess by the Mughal officer by the Mughal general. Uh, now uh, this uh, Tanhaji again again it is built on a historical uh, event that happened, but this subplot is somehow mythological, somehow, and uh, this somehow serves the purpose of uh, what can be understood as, you know, uh, inculcating the idea of love jihad in the minds of the viewers who are watching this particular movie. Now, obviously, uh, all of this is there, and this is the narrative that has been there for the past seven to ten years uh, from present, and uh, in all of this narrative, what I am trying to, uh, you know, talk about today is how uh, there were movies which were made uh, and the, which were popular movies, which were movies that were, um, uh, that had a wide audience, that had a popular, uh, you know, support. And those movies showcased inter-religious love, Hindu-Muslim love. And this idea of Hindu-Muslim or inter-religious love is, uh, you know, uh, the epitome of this kind of love is in the, uh, you know, in the love story of Jodha and Akbar. Uh, Jodha being a Rajput princess and Akbar being a Mughal king. Uh, a brief uh, historical uh, you know, um, uh, footnote here, uh, just to clarify. Jodha uh, is uh, a, a misleading name. There was no wife of Akbar by the name of Jodha. There was uh, a Hindu wife, a Rajput wife of Emperor Akbar, but her name was not Jodha. Uh, nevertheless, there was a Rajput princess who was married to a Mughal emperor. 
and uh, the, uh, the the myth of Jodha uh, um, started to develop in 18th century for the Kusikri, and eventually uh, that caught on. And uh, K. Asif, uh, when he made Mughal e Azam, he uh, took the name Jodha, and since then uh, Jodha Akbar has been the you know uh, ideal love story that has been there. And uh, in this uh, love story, in the love story that Mughal e Azam and Jodha Akbar represent, Mughal e Azam was made in 1960. It was soon after Indian independence. Uh, Indian popular media, but Indian uh, you know media, Indian cinema uh, was the place where uh, a newly independent Indian would go and would visualize itself, you know, as a part of a larger, um, uh, you know, independent nation. And in that uh, uh, frame of mind, in that popular, uh, you know, idea that was there. Uh, the idea of an India, uh, a complete India, which was united under uh, Akbar, Mughal emperor, uh, who ruled around 17th, uh, 16th century. Uh, that particular uh, movie uh, saw, somehow, you know, showed uh, an India which was united, an India which was prosperous, an India which was being served by the Muslim Mughal emperor, an India which was not being invaded or not being harassed or not being, you know, um, um, oppressed by that uh, Mughal uh, Muslim king. So that was the idea with which uh, Mughal -e Azam was made. Mughal -e Azam is a love story, not of Jodha Akbar, but of uh, Akbar's son, uh, Prince Salim and a courtesan. Uh, that's a different story. But in Mughal -e Azam, uh, the Jodha and Akbar are shown not just as a, a you know, beautiful husband and wife couple, but also, you know, Jodha is represented as a queen who stands up for her uh, nation, who stands up, not nation, for her kingdom, uh, a queen who takes a stand for her husband, even if it means going against her son, even if it means sacrificing the love of her son. So all of that is there. So Jodha is, uh, and, and such a similar is the representation of Jodha in the love story, Jodha Akbar, which was made in 2008. And uh, in um, the, both these movies, Jodha is represented as a strong uh, Rajput princess who has her own opinions, who has her own mind, and she is not uh, simply manipulated into the marriage because of, uh, you know, by the Mughal emperor, by the you know, Muslim emperor. Uh, these are a the few scenes that are there which show uh, the beauty of uh, the representation of how uh, uh, beautiful it was, uh, beautifully the love of these, uh, you know, to how beautiful this interfaith, interreligious love is represented in these movies. But this is uh, an older Jodha and Agbar who are, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this scene is basically a celebration of, uh, the birth of Lord Krishna and how the birth of Lord Krishna was a Hindu god is being celebrated at the Mughal court. And that was a historical, that is a historical fact. A lot of Hindu festivals were celebrated at um, Muslim courts, at Mughal courts, and Muslims had somehow imbibed Hindu culture, imbibed indigenous culture. That's a discussion for a different time. So this is uh, a scene, and these are this is the scene where Jodha is, uh, you know, taking a stand uh, by sacrificing her motherly love and taking a stand and for her husband, uh, her uh, and this is uh, from the modern, uh, recently made movie, 2008, uh, Jodha Akbar, in which uh, uh, the beautiful love of uh, this interfaith couple is represented in a number of ways. So uh, what I am trying to argue here is, uh, in this modern day narrative of love, Jodha, have, how, how have we lost this, these stories of interfaith love, interfaith romances? which were there, which were represented, which were popularly accepted even till 2008. And, you know, the coming, uh, the uh, idea of uh, the revival of the idea of love jihad in 2009 uh, eventually led to the, say, uh, communalization of uh, popular cinema. Because uh, in Jodha Akbar, uh, the movie that was made in 2008, we see that uh, uh, what I understand, it is the last attempt at secular representation or a true uh, you know, representation of a secular nature uh, of any uh, Muslim character in the Indian um, cinema. Because uh, I know for a fact that uh, the maker of the movie, Ashutosh Gavarakar, was in touch, was in contact with a lot of historians. He uh, made it a point to get all the historical facts correctly. He uh, also, uh, and, and he had a discussion in a meeting with a group of historians, uh, medieval historians who had primarily worked on the, you know, uh, uh, on that particular time period on the um, um, Akbar and his, you know, time period. So all of that is there. And um, somehow that idea, somehow that love story, even though it is uh, mythological or even though it is, uh, you know, artistic uh, uh, creation in order to serve uh, another purpose, but uh, this idea of love, this idea of interfaith uh, uh, relationship, which could be celebrated, 
is there and uh, it's not just uh, uh, there it's also uh, upheld it's also uh, not questioned it's also uh, because we know jodha of 2008 was a widely successful film highly successful uh, hindi cinema hindi movie so if that is there so somehow we have lost that uh, idea and so we come how we have lost that narrative and now uh, if there is a representation of a muslim figure it's usually in those tones of uh, barbarity in those tones of hatred in those tones of oppressive irrational uh, behavior that is there so uh the, the, it's just a uh, you know i'm open for discussion open for suggestions uh, i'm trying to reread or uh, you know uh, revive that uh, idea that notion of a love between uh, a hindu and muslim it can also be a hindu woman a uh, hindu uh, man and a muslim woman and uh, you know there have been recent attempts by certain social media platforms to uh, popularize modern day uh, similar love stories between interreligious couples intercaste couples so all that is there and uh and i'll just uh, i hope i'll uh, have time for discussion so we can take up certain questions and i can explain in more detail about some of these aspects in the discussion uh, i conclude here thank you uh, i hope it is somehow uh, better you know somehow increase the information for you guys so thank you great so thank you very much for for this uh, fascinating interesting lecture uh the picture of muslims in movies uh, from india and so the latest tendencies love jihad and so on so um now the uh, as you have uh, been told by the organizers uh, the system is uh, uh, the following so please write your um questions comments in the chat and then we will read them and um then the speakers will answer So while the first people are uh writing their questions into the chats um yeah okay i see already something um yeah so this um there's uh, maybe the organizers can uh, turn on the microphone yes uh, yes first if you want to initiate discussion between the chair and the, the other panelists uh, feel free to and uh, you know so we give you some time to elaborate as panelists and then if not we move on to directly uh the question from the audience and i will activate the the microphone uh for the people who have questions yes so ah okay so then i can misuse my position and start with a with a short question um uh, first to uh mrs porillo um i was i was wondering um uh, listening to your presentation um it seems that somehow it um presupposes okay. uh, presupposes a very yeah uh, it, it's it's okay i'll will give you the floor in a moment yeah yeah thank you thank you because i have to talk in voice uh, uh dear it, andre it, thank you very much okay hello can you hear yes yes okay uh, i have to talk andre uh from philippine thank you uh maybe i may heard wrong but not warang parang parang wa warang not warang parang this is very important because yeah. if you know the chinese letter we pronounce it parang not warang maybe i may heard wrong okay so i just mentioned <laughs> i have to stop in english in the voice and i have one question to you in this case you mentioned about the medievalism in joseon joseon period in the medievalism this is a renaissance time although yes. we have same dress same costume but we have different period in different influence from the mongol tang tang dynasty so why do you say medievalism for the joseon okay I, i think that's a very very good question as uh, thank you comes hamida uh It's a very interesting question because um the definition of medievalism in other countries is very much debatable I think it's not something that is very universal as we think at least in our point of view in our department it's something like um we cannot say that medievalism is very universal because it's something based on the developments in the west now analyzing which one to present in this um presentation in Korea I think is um it sort of we sort of base it on the 
period of time based on uh, something that, for example, medievalism in the West is from 500 CE to 1500s. And the periods in Korea, which we, which um, covers that is sort of um, from the three kingdoms, not late third king, three kingdoms up to a part of Joseon. But it's impossible to actually border the three kingdoms in Joseon, which would immediately fit the definition that the time of medievalism in the West, because as I have said, it's based on the developments in the West. So basically our idea of medievalism cannot actually apply because we have a different, for example, in the Philippines, we have a different um, period. So basically medievalism in middle ages is before at least, um, at least in our point of view, is before uh, Japanese interaction and occupation and colonization at that sense and before the modern times. And yes, it's about Renaissance at the time in the West, but I think in terms of other contexts, I think it fits. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for uh, the pronunciation. Um, I, I'm still it's a rigid Korean. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, um, then we have an, uh, another question from Jordan Foltz uh, to Mrs. Bolilo. Um, how does the depiction of the Sengoku Jidai compare to other contemporary depictions of the period in other media? Mm, thank you for the question. Uh, in fact, as uh, well, it is very uh, very well known that Japanese media is uh, transmedia in most uh, most of times. That means that video games inspire anime, anime inspire video games, and manga inspire both of them. Uh, that is uh, to say, uh, for example, in the case of Koei, the Sengoku Basara anime is um, inspired by Koei franchise, and there are uh, anime of the Sengoku Muso saga, and those uh, depictions are the same in the video games are those in the anime. Uh, it seems that the oldest, uh, be it anime, manga, or video games, all of them take inspiration in the gunki and in the ukiyo-e, because uh, one of the theories is that manga and later anime, it, uh, it is an evolution of ukiyo-e popular culture. So all of them uh, are based on the same sources. So the depictions are very uniform. And uh, these characters has been in popular culture of the for a long time. That means that they have a very uh, established uh, characteristics. And if you don't put them in popular culture, uh, the public won't uh, know those characters. You have to respect not the historical truth, but the popular, uh, what has been diffused by the popular culture from uh, ancient time, from the 19th or 17th century from Ukiyo-e. That means it is uh, uh, pretty uniform, the representation of the Sengoku Jidai, be it uh, video games, manga, or anime. I hope I have answered the question. Yeah. Then we have a question from Francis Mikus um, to everybody, actually. Uh, so first, uh, he says that uh, he admires the ambitious use of colors in all three film cultures. And then to what extent is the term medieval valid in these cases? Is there a sense of antiquity and modernity in these cultures with an in-between? I think uh, you can you can choose who 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 wants to start. <laughs> I come again then. In the case of Japanese historiography, uh, we don't use the same eras of uh, European ones or American ones. You use the uh, an specific uh, specific eras uh, from which. Uh, well, now they are uh, with the Gregorian calendar, but uh, historically Japanese, uh, the eras of Japanese history has been decided by the emperors. And then uh, historians, Japanese historians have uh, merged uh, some, of he some of those eras that are very close in time and that uh, have formed the historiographical 
eras that we study today. Um, that is the Muromachi, that the, well, if you do, we go to the prehistory, the Yayoi, the Kofun, the Asuka, the Nara, the Heian, Kamakura, eh, Muromachi, Asusimo Moyama, Edo, eh, Meiji, eh, Taisho, Showa, Heisei, Reiwa. Those are all the history, uh, all the periods of Japanese histo uh, historiography. Uh, but we can compare them to European history. For example, uh, what is medieval uh, medieval Japan? Because it, their political organization is very similar to those of uh, the feudal European uh, countries, are uh, from the Kamakura period more or less until the Edo period. But that is from 14th uh, Siegel until 19th century. It is very long. So uh, we uh, call it medieval Japan. So to uh, try to uniform with other uh, with other specialized or specialists, but in fact, uh, Japanese history has its own set of eras, and it is better to refer it with them. I think. So maybe briefly also the Korean and Indian perspective. Um, for me, I actually completely agree that it's impossible to actually define medievalism uh, exactly. And I have uh, actually talked with it that Ms. Um, um, uh, Hosokli actually asked that um, the Joseon period is uh, a, a long renaissance and so almost in more early modern. But I think I propose somehow the idea on why we chose this is that uh, first we need to place it before contact before the age of contact. And second is we need to um, actually think about the timeline and if it actually patterns it, for example, from uh, 500 to 1500s, what is happening? Does it fit the actual timeline? It, is it um, as in a smaller scale or a, a longer period? So what I'm saying is we base it on context that it's supposed to be after prehistory and classics so that's supposedly proto the proto this kingdoms and then the middle ages and supposedly the age of contacts the the explorations in the, this case in korea what we saw as a good mark when we were um finding it out is the contact of japan but as i've said i've said there uh, uh, i mean colonization but as i've said there have been many contacts already from china from mongols and so it's a long debate on whether we could actually consider it as medievalism in the global sense, because we have different histories and we have in different countries. Yes, and in the Indian context, I completely agree with the comment that there is no idea of global medievalism. There is no idea of uh, you know, global singular timeline for all the. You know, locations from these places. In Indian context, uh, the history that was the earliest history that was written, history in the modern sense of the term history uh, as we know it today. It was written in the time of Colonial rulers. It was written as original uh, notions, and they read that uh, and they wrote uh, that Luna, in history, Luna, and that I'm is sorry. why they divided Luna. Indian history into. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. your internet is failing. Know? Maybe it's better if you turn off your camera and you continue speaking because I think we couldn't properly hear what you were saying. Right, right, right. right. I'm really sorry. Uh, am I audible now? Is it audible now? Yes. Right. Okay, okay, okay. So in, in Indian context, uh, I was just saying that modern history as we know it in Indian context has been written in the times of uh, colonial rulers in the British times. And uh, uh, the colonizers somehow represented Indians as incapable of being able to, you know, uh, uh, have modern rational thoughts. And uh, that is why they divided Indian history into a Hindu period, a Muslim period, and a British period. Not a Christian period, but a British period. And that Hindu period uh, then was termed as an ancient uh, period. The Muslim period uh, was a medieval period. And uh, then there was uh, obviously the uh, time where the British were ruling. And we eventually 
this was the earliest timeline or the earliest division of Indian time or Indian history that was history. Everything before the Muslim invasion or the, before the Muslim conquest is ancient. Um, and uh, everything uh, which, uh, you know, for example, the Turkish rule from 13th century uh, to say uh, 16th century and the Mughal rule from 16th century to 19th century is uh, all medieval um, till the coming of uh, the British. And uh, this is the division to which uh, most of the later scholars have also uh, stuck to. But uh, now, uh, in present times, there have been uh, many uh, questions that have been raised regarding this historiographic, historiographic you know, narrative. And uh, there have been uh, you know, uh, somehow attempts to call uh, a period early modern instead of medieval. For example, the Mughal period has been called by a number of scholars as early modern but not medieval. And uh, there have been many debates, many discussions, and many arguments and counter arguments about this division. So it's definitely not universal, and that's definitely not should not be universal in that sense. Thank you. Great. So um, there were some interruptions, but I think we got the, the most part of it. And uh, you're always free uh, to exchange emails uh, among each other, of course, and um, uh, to clarify things. So I think we have to, to hurry up a little bit because there's not much time. Therefore, the next question uh, from Carolina. Um, to Andre, I'm actually wondering what is the influence of K-pop culture uh, on these TV series regarding aesthetics, music, and so on? Um, I'll answer it quickly. There is a very large influence, especially as you can see in Warang. Uh, uh, there is. Uh, the music that they use in this um, series, it involves K-pop, pop music in short. Uh, it's very, not very, it's uh, it has something of a kind of aesthetics that is different from the Western medieval films. Uh, it uses a lot of pop culture, pop music, even dances, that it actually is even in the audience perspective, a lot of uh, actors are K-pop idols. So in, in the audience itself that they are targeting. So yeah, so very, basically there is a large influence and it would be very, very long to talk about those influences, but there is, and it's, it's a very large influence. Um, I'm Daniel. Sorry, if I can give some remarks. Uh, we're running out of time, but I think we can maybe take 10 more minutes uh, okay. so we can go through the questions. In any case, I will ask, of course, if the panelists are willing to, if you can write your emails in the chat, if case anybody wants to contact you and send you their questions directly. But I think we can take until 1240. Okay, great. So um, this gives us a little bit more time. So the next question um, is from Andrew Elliott to all. Thank you for all. Uh, thank you all for uh, three very interesting papers. I'm really interested in Lubna's comment about how historical stereotypes continue into the present. I think there is something really important about imagined historical continuities which crosses all three papers, and which is emerging here in the question about periodization. How useful are labels like Renaissance and medievalism when thinking in terms of global medievalism? Um, Lubna, are you there? Yes. Um, uh, again, uh, I think the second part of the question is somehow we've already talked about how global medievalism and the term, the terms that are, uh, uh, you know, uh, somehow considered universal are not universal. And you know, every uh, 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 space, every place has its own history and its own uh, periodization, and uh, you know that should be the case. And uh, we've talked about that part. Uh, and regarding the first part of the question, yes, in uh, how uh, I think that was more of a comment instead of a question. But I agree that uh, in the present, uh, the, how uh, history and historical figures are represented in the present uh, is somehow uh, important, uh, and uh, how history is recreated is. Um, in a way, uh, 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 you know, uh, in pow uh, power of the present generation and present historians, and it's important to uh, uh, maintain historical accuracy and not let uh, these, uh, uh, you know, uh, circumstances of present times, uh, like communal tensions or you know racial tensions, to um, uh, tinge history or tinge historical narratives or popular depiction of history. But that somehow happens. Uh, that is something that cannot be denied, and uh, that should be acknowledged and that should be exposed. That's what I'd like to add. 
Uh, yeah. So can, can I ask a question? Is related to to what we were discussing, uh, because of course, uh, ser uh, several of the panelists, as you have mentioned, we cannot really extrapolate this notion of Western history of ancient, medieval, Renaissance, and modern to other historical periods, or sorry, to other regions of, of the planet. However, uh, there's something that I think maybe would be interesting to to discuss and to consider, and then is that sometimes medieval is not necessarily a period. It can also be a set of characteristics that we uh, that we somehow associate with whatever we mean by medieval. I, I think this notion, for example, of medieval Japan is very is very telling. Not necessarily because the Sengoku period is in the middle of something, but because it seems to recreate this idea that we have of chaotic warlords at war with one them, among themselves and the crumbling of central power. I think, for example, when those also, what Andre mentioned about the role of fantasy in many of these productions is something that we tend somehow, not necessarily, but uh, when we think about historical fantasy, at least in the West, we try, we normally tend to associate it mostly with medieval, with the Middle Ages. So I would like to know your opinion regarding this fact. Of course, we cannot talk about uh, medievalisms in the terms of, of, of chronology. But maybe we can talk about medievalisms in terms of ideas and representation. Not necessarily mean that the representations are historically accurate, but that there are, there are like patterns like these temporal stasis, these long lost past, uh, the role of magic and superstition, the decentralization of power. Uh, those characteristics that we have somehow constructed to mean Middle Ages, and maybe in this sense, we could talk about global medievalisms. Again, being also very much aware that it is a representation and not necessarily a historical accurate one. I would like to uh, add a you know, uh, comment to this because uh, when we are talking about certain characteristics of medievalism, then again, we are also talking about those characteristics um, as, uh, you know, as they are there in the Western uh, historiography or in Western, uh, you know, uh, historical narrative, because uh, when we talk about certain characteristics, as you pointed out, about uh, you know decentralization or about uh, prominence of superstition, these features were not there in what we call uh, uh, or were not that prominent in what we call medieval India, but still we call it medieval India. So, yes, there is a need to you know identify, uh, for example, in India, when uh, the medieval period that we're talking about was a strongly centralized empire, or uh, you know had strongly centralized rule. Uh, there was a, a, an emperor at the center who controlled a vast region. And, and uh, there was, uh, you know, many important uh, texts which are uh, on rational uh, ideas, on scientific uh, narratives, were written in that time, were translated in that time. So uh, yeah, it's an interesting uh, area to discuss. So how do we define medievalism? Is it a historical time period? Is it a set of characteristics? And if it is a set of characteristics, so uh, then we have to redefine medieval uh, period for various other uh, regions, and you know, we have to completely redefine uh, historiography of other regions. And this medieval or these characteristics of medieval are again a, a Western, uh, uh, somehow Western uh, characteristics or characteristics which have been uh, propagated in Western historiography. So, yeah. Comments from the other speakers? Mm, yes, I about, uh, yeah. ah, thank you. Uh, sorry, Andre. Uh, about the this uh, medieval uh, this uh, globalization of the term of medievalism, I think, for example, with the uh, Sengoku period, that applies very well. But for example, Edo period is considered medieval Japan because it is not Renaissance. But it has a feudal uh, feudal system. With uh, it's the same feudal system system of the Sengoku period, but it is peaceful and it is uh, centralized because they are all controlled by the Tokugawa dynasty. Uh, then it is a feudal system, but it is totally different from the Sengoku period. But it is not exactly. It's uh, the cities develop and uh, it appears a new bureaucracy and things like that. And that is more like the uh, Renaissance of the European countries, but it is considered medieval because it's a feudal system. So even if we try, I think it's very difficult with uh, other cultures, specifically the Asian ones to try to even uh, 
uh, set as uh, some characteristics that are common to all the period because what I say the, the Japanese uh, medieval period is from Kamakura which is uh, with the Mongols until the Edo period that it's all peaceful and all in between then there are yeah, in reality there is there are no common uh, characteristics there are some common characteristics but very few so I think maybe that concept should be uh, mat uh, matized always uh, the, depending on the cultures because uh, I think in in the end uh, each country has its own terms and its own uh, form of organizing the periods because it is necessary that they have that type of organization and there is not really a need to uniform it we can try it and uh, if I talk about the Sengoku period, we all are going to say, yes, that's medieval Japan, okay. But if I come here with a Edo period presentation, maybe this debate, I can say, this is feudal Japan, but no, this is not because then I think there are always going to be points of conflict if we try to uniform everything <laughs> with Asian cultures. <laughs> I feel that maybe it should be Mati said. I, I think it's very difficult this of uh, global medievalism. I don't know what Andre might think. Yeah, I completely agree that there will always be conflict with it, and I don't know how we could actually decide which one is medieval and so on. But uh, just a comment on what um, Mr. Juana said about uh, in the aspect of popular culture, it does exist. The commonalities between uh, thinking what is medievalism as we see the uh, guards kingdoms and the fantasy elements in it because I, I study popular culture a lot and new media and this exists in this popular representation and it gives us a similarity of what we can consider as medieval but at the same time i think we we can't actually be careful in actually labeling which is medieval or not and renaissance and since even in the the word renaissance is something about uh real the classic it's, it's all about a real something really real learning it and so it's not actually a cultural concept that is present in these eastern histories that we are studying so i agree i completely agree that um there would always be conflict in labeling but at least we had this idea in presenting uh non-western notions of medievalism uh in this panel i think it's a very good start in exploring these kinds of themes that we haven't really gotten to learn before Yeah, then we have another question from Francis Mikus uh, to Claudia. Is there the same sense of simplification in the Japanese as in the Western games we talked about before? Mm, if you understand correctly, the, the question is if the Western games are uh, about Japan are uh, simplified too. I think he means that. Uh, I have to say that about the Western games based on Japan in general, uh, in Sengoku period, but in the Mongo, in the Kamakura period, for example, the Ghost of Tsushima, for example, uh, or Total War uh, for PC, it is of the Sengoku period. I have a study, it is not my main uh, object of a study, but I have uh, uh, played them and studied them a bit. and. Western games are uh, too much interested in represent a real Japan, something that even if it even if it knows if it is not Japanese, it seems Japanese. For example, in Total War, they use ukiyo-e because it is so Japanese ukiyo-e, but ukiyo-e are, are not from the Sengoku period. The art of the Sengoku period is from China because the culture, uh, the important culture, it was from China and it was not the Japanese one. So in their, uh, they want to make all look so Japanese that they uh, stray a lot from the historical facts and of the what was the true feeling of Japan of every period. The Japanese games are not, uh, they don't uh, have the necessity to seem Japanese. They are Japanese and they are talking about Japan, about their history. 
so they can focus in the historical facts and in the entertainment, of course, and that is, uh, and because of that, there are uh, uh, little uh, in a, in a quadrasis. There are not correct things in that. But Western games, at least what ha the ones I have studied, they are so preoccupied with sim Japanese that the historical facts normally they are all mixed and they they are only superficially Japanese, at least. Uh, I think it's sad because uh, we should know better in the, we are not in the 19th century with the Japanese. <laughs> we, we should uh, try to understand the other culture and not only the superficial code of it. But it is it is what it sells. And if it doesn't seem Japanese, it won't sell. And video game is an industry. so. I suppose it is to be expected. Yeah. Um, so I think we have uh, slowly come to an end. Um, most of the contributions are now uh, somehow uh, comments. And I think you can continue. We all can continue talking to each other about these things. Obviously, the term of medievalism and uh, the periodization is, is interesting for everybody. And um, especially um, the question of in how far Western models were exported and adapted. I just want to to add that it's it's on different levels. Yeah, I mean, if you look, uh, I think one of the comments has also mentioned China. Yeah, and China, I think it uh, the Marxist view of uh, um, of the Middle Ages as a, a, a feudalist society, for example, had has had an impact. Yeah, on how they um, uh, they parody, uh, they do their parodization in in China, which is. Um, um, as you all know, I mean, the parodization, the European one, does not fit at all in China. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't make sense. Yeah, in in a, in, in in no way. Uh, however, um, there are tendencies to to adopt it, and this comes also from different levels. And one of uh, them is uh, are, for example, Marxist ideas. And I think there. Uh, so we have always to look um, what is the level and what is the um, in in which context this term um, uh, Middle Ages or, or medieval is transported to other cultures and how it is uh, adapted, yeah? Because I think there are complex ways of interconnections. And so uh, this is certainly a very, very interesting topic. So um, if there are uh, no other questions, and I think you can continue uh, in, uh, uh, other channels uh, uh, discussing all these things, then I would like to thank all the speakers very, very much and also the discussants for contributing. I think it was in extremely interesting and extremely interesting also to have a look um, uh, to this world, uh, uh, India, uh, Korea, from a Philippine perspective uh, and Japan from a, a Spanish perspective. So this is uh, uh, super interesting and I think it contributes very much to the topic. And I will give, give back the word to the organizers. So Vanya, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniel, for these concluding thoughts. And once again, thank you to the wonderful panelists uh, for your wonderful contributions, very thought provoking as we could see from the chat box, the discussion really kicked in. Thank you, Daniel, for sharing uh, uh, so nicely this session. And before uh, you go, I remind you that uh, we have uh, another panel coming up at uh, half past one, uh, which is titled On-Screen Uses of the Middle Ages. So if we want to take part in that uh, session, that would be great. And uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, hopefully I'll see you for the next panel.